Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 4. We're going to go through uh, verses 1 through 16. And we're kind of closing out the series on church diagnostics. And we're closing it out uh, just kind of with the question of, are, are you fitting in where you should be inside of a church? And I know this is often a very hard question, and it's going to work into the question of church membership, which is always everybody's favorite topic. Um, every time I walk around places, people run up to me and say, you're a pastor, right? And I say, yes. And it's like, let's talk about church membership. I mean, it's just, I have to fight. It, it might not be something that's explicitly commanded in the Bible, but I, I think it's something that's, that's good and healthy. Um, now, I'm not sure everybody knows this or not. Um, some of you might be aware of it, but for four years, I worked inside of a cafeteria. At Cornerstone University, I, I did most things. Um, and it started off with being someone who just, you know, I, I was able to get one shift. It was a two-hour shift on Thursday nights, and I was able to just, my job was to make sure that the dishes were stocked at the station, so that way when people went through um, at the cafeteria, they could have their dishes. And it worked up to then the next semester I was able to, I was in, in the dish room and I was scrubbing pots and pans. And then the next year, one of the head people, one of the white coats, um, so one of the full-time employees that got benefits, um, he said, Ben, do you want to know how to cook for your wife? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we need someone in the middle of the cafeteria. So the cafeteria was set up with different stations and in the middle there was like a, a, a three-quarter circle where you had two um, essentially burners that you were making the food there. Um, so you were sauteing something or you were doing potato. It was like you were a live action cook, so to say. And um, I'm like, I was, I was nervous. I was like, I don't want to mess this up. They're like, are you sure? He's like, no, you, you can do it. We, we need someone to fill in. And so I, we did it, and I, I, I was that person, and I enjoyed it. It was fun. And then, like, Ben, do you want to make omelets? And I became known as the omelet guy on Cornerstone campus. Um, yes, uh, I, I know we're not supposed to boast, but um, this is just the facts of it. If Tom Brady were to say he won a Super Bowl, he wouldn't be boasting. Um, my buddy, Jason Edgecombe, and I were, had the most attended omelet station in the week. People planned their breakfasts to come whenever we were working, and um, I loved it. I would know what people wanted before they came up, because usually you'd, they'd, you know, they would uh, you know, fill out, you know, if they wanted cheese or no cheese on a slip, and then they'd fill up a cup with different stuff, you know, olives, ham, whatnot, and there were, I, I memorized what people wanted, and I said, okay, you want this, okay, you want it running, you don't want this, and people just had such a good time, and I actually almost missed this, but I never would have known that I was the omelet guy if my overseer had not have said, Ben, do you want to work in the middle? I would have been fully content scrubbing pots and pans and working in the dish room. I kind of really secretly enjoyed scrubbing the pots and pans. I don't know why. Um, it was enjoyable. But I really enjoyed making omelets. Now, what, what does cafeteria work and omelets have to do with the church? Well, you see, we as Christians aren't always fully aware of who God designed us to be and what our giftings are. Oftentimes, we, we float around, and sadly, sometimes people float from church to church, and they never really sit down, and, and they never have two things happen. One, they never have a, someone in leadership ask them, hey, do you want to do something? Or two, they never accept the invitation to do something. Here in our church, we've offered many times, hey, does someone want to be part of a committee? Does someone want to help with Bible builders? Does someone want to do X, Y, Z? And we watch it, and I, I sit and I think, how many people 
are like me and they never knew that they not only would be good at something, but they would enjoy it. So part of the reason why I'm in Ephesians 4 is because Paul is making this transition from this theological reality of what happened with Jesus redeeming people, taking them from being dead to being alive. But not only that, he's working into the practical application of what it means to be a believer. And if you listen to the language here in Ephesians 4, you'll see maybe not church membership explicitly, but you'll see why the umbrella of belonging to a church is not only beneficial, but almost, you could say, theologically necessary. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. And when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So, everyone saw the connection to omelets, right? No. Well, look at, look at the first few verses. These first few verses are, I think, paramount to understanding the reality of Christians. Um, there's a verse that's re there's a word that's repeated over and over and over and over and over. One, 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 one. Paul does not like the idea of scattered, helter skelter, maverick Christianity. Instead, he has this reality that he's calling the people to be. That if they want to live to be as Jesus calls them to be, then they got to bear with each other, making every effort they can in order to be having this bond of peace. This bond of peace of one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So as Christians... We look at what Paul's saying here in Ephesians, and my first question is, how many of you think of unity as the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear about Christians? I, I hate to say it, but that is way down on my list, and I've spent many years reading lots of books about Christianity. I've spent almost my entire life in the church. Usually the idea of Christianity is division. You know, if someone were to say, are you a Christian? In America, we'd say yes or no. And then they'd usually say, what church do you belong to? What denomination is that? On well, Baptist. What kind of Baptist? Southern Baptist, Northern Baptist, American Baptist, Heritage Baptist, First Baptist, Second Baptist. And we laugh. 
But as Christians, usually we show disunity. We want to show what we don't have in common versus what we do have in common. But where do you learn what you have in common with other believers? Have you asked that question? And like, where are you supposed to go? Because you have to laugh because, I mean, it sounds simple. Well, you just got to read the Bible. Well, reading the Bible is also where we've found the people having hundreds of thousands of different interpretations. The Bible is the authoritative word given by God as to how we should live and practice. And inside the word of God, God also shows that he established the church with leaders, with elders, with, and then the first church, apostles. And they came together. In Acts 15, they came up with the answer of, what do we do about these Gentiles who are coming into our Jewish faith? They worked through tough questions. And over the centuries, they, came, they worked through all these things. And so I want to tell you, first off and for, foremost, church should be a place where you learn what unites us with other believers. Remember last week, I didn't tell you to get baptized again if you were at another church. And I didn't tell you that your communion's false if you did it one way versus another. As Christians, if we aren't teaching each other the uttermost centrality, importance of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, then we're doing it wrong. But you see, if all you do is bounce from church to church to church, or you don't actually put yourself under the teaching of the people inside of a church, you miss out. Because how many of you know what Article 2 of our church constitution is? I laugh because even us on the CLC would all pull out our constitution to read it. I've been teaching through the church doctrinal statement to the junior, senior high class. And it's just kind of sad to think about these are the basic, fundamental beliefs that our church has. I mean, these are not deep things. These aren't like, here's an eight-syllable word that you're going to learn the history to. But these are what unites us. And so as a Christian church, we also realize Listen to this. Verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live the life worthy of the calling you have received. You see, we're united under the reality that God called us forth from a life of sin and death and selfishness and brought us into the life of union with one another, union with Jesus, and a life of hope. In verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, usually whenever a group of people comes together, they have to have a unified goal and purpose. But not only that, there needs to be a reason why people keep that goal and purpose. You know, you, if you want to have the best, you know, whenever the, the Lions Club, it's not just a group of guys that, ma that gathers together, it's a group of people who have joined a club, paid dues, sworn to have a mission and a purpose, and they go about it. You know, if I were to walk into a Lions Club meeting and say, hey guys, you all need to buy basketballs for every kid in the junior high so they can get better. They'd say, first off, you're not a member. Second off, our purpose is not to provide basketballs. Third off, if you want to make a comment, here's what you need to do, right? Is there anything wrong with basketballs? No. In fact, I told Jack earlier in Sunday school, praise God for basketball. But what does basketball have to do with Lions Club? It doesn't, because Lions Club's a specific purpose specific club. And we as Christians got to realize that we've been called from being disunified, living in our sin, living in our flesh, to being people who are part of the body of Christ. 
The capital C church, the church that spans borders, the, the church that I had mentioned a couple weeks ago that says, I can have more in common with someone who's a Christian in Rwanda than the unbeliever who lives maybe next door. Because we have this bond that Paul talks about here. But where do you learn about this? You learn about it in the gathering of believers, where we come together and discuss the word of God together. And the reason why I further believe that this is so important is, verse 7 it says, But to each one of us, grace has been given, as Christ apportioned it. That word grace is the broader term of a gift or a blessing. And what is this blessing? Well, verse 14 it says, verse 11, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his church for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So God has given believers gifts and has given churches specific gifts of those who can teach and equip and cause the church to be built up. It's interesting, it says a few different items. Evangelists. How many people are evangelists, but they don't know it yet? I mean, you talk to some people, and they'd say, oh, I could, I could never share the gospel. I, I don't know how to do it. You say, well, it's not that hard. How, what is salvation? That's this. Oh, well, do people, yeah. And then you talk them through a couple things, and then you know what? Ten years later, you have Billy Graham preaching to 100,000 people at a time. And all it took was someone saying, you know what, I actually think that you have this gift and you need to use it. Or teaching. How many people have you heard the story of, I could never teach kids. Oh my goodness, this is terrifying. And then you're like, all right, yep, next week you're teaching children's church. And then like, are you sure? Yep, I'm sure. I'll be there sitting in the back to make sure that no kids die. And then three years later, they're the one who's in charge of this, the children's church material. They're the one in charge of everything. And they say, this is the most blessed thing I've ever done. Oh my goodness, the kids are smiling and I've watched this kid learn how to do this. And A church is where you find out how you were designed by God to help his kingdom grow. Now, when I say that, I want to just pause and say, we as leaders in Grace Bible Church could have done a better job of challenging everybody to use their spiritual gifts more in the time that I've been here. I don't think I've pushed people as hard as maybe we could. I haven't given everybody a spiritual gift test, but I mean, there's 17 different ways that you can find out what's your gift. But what is something that you enjoy doing? Just ask yourself that one question. What is something you enjoy doing? Now, is it? Now, what is something you're good at doing? Oftentimes, what you enjoy and what you're good at are two separate things. That's me and basketball. I, like I said, I practiced basketball for 10 years just to get cut. Like, what you're good at and what, you're, what you enjoy may not be the same thing. But then ask yourself, how can I use those two things to help people know the love of God. If you love running, become a track and cross country coach and get yourself in the school and tell the kids about Jesus. If you love basketball, if you love football, if you love baseball, if you love volleyball, if you love softball, get yourself in the school teaching kids about Jesus. That being said, you are still called to coach there. Don't just, don't get fired the first week. You enjoy changing tires. Well, you know what? In the past five months, I knew someone who needed a tire change on their car. And it took about every tool necessary to change that tire. Don't think that there's any gift you have that's beneath God's ability to use for his kingdom. I mean, this is just where, again, what do you enjoy 
And what are you good at? Now I'm going to use a crazy out of the, just out of the ordinary, wouldn't even guess that I would say this. I don't own a firearm. I don't have a gun. I don't have, don't have a Floyd card. But do you know what? There's lots of people who do, and they enjoy shooting. You know what you could maybe do? Hey guys, I got a target. We're going to shoot some targets, and we're going to talk about Jesus afterwards. Weird association, but you know what? Have you used your joy of that to share Jesus? I've used my joy of running to talk to kids out on runs, saying, hey, who do you want to be? What do you want to grow up to be? Where do you find your identity? What do you enjoy doing? And this goes back to the fact that as we know what we're doing and we fall under the leadership and the guidance because someone might say, this is something I enjoy doing. How can I use it for the church? And so then you come to the deacons and we talk with you and we say, hey, this is something we're already doing. We'll plug you into here. Or, hey, that's a great idea. Let's run with it. Here's a committee that you can work with. And we'll move forward. Just like, remember, last month we said, who do you know that needs food that we can just buy groceries for. But as we're working together, again, the focus is upon using it for Jesus. Because hopefully what you're doing as you're going out and you're doing things is you're, you're pushing people to trust Jesus more. You're pushing people to confess of their sins. You're pushing people to shed unhealthy habits. You're pushing people to actually ask, is that what the Bible teaches or is that something that you were taught? Now, this is, this is a, a weird distinction that I want to give because just because you grew up in church hearing something every week. Now, this is weird coming from the mouth of a pastor, but just because you heard something every week at church does not mean it's true or from the Bible. And as Christians... We should never be afraid of having our belief challenged with Scripture. Hey, Ben, I think that the Bible says this, that, and the other thing. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's do it. Because the more firmly rooted you become in Scripture, the more firmly rooted you become in a church family that can have those conversations, verse 14 happens. Then you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. See, as Christians, we use every gift we have to point people back to Jesus. And this is where... I know that doesn't say, so therefore be a member of a church. I know. But that, that is the assumption, that is the therefore that the church has historically understood. Over 2,000 years of church interpretation, looking at Acts, looking at the epistles, we're supposed to belong to a body. That that body can be what strengthens us and challenges us and encourages us and shapes us and molds us. If I wanted to become an omelet maker outside of a cafeteria, I would have had to find what kind of pan do I buy? How much heat do I use? Do you keep the egg whites or not? What kind of cheese is the best in the middle? How do you, do you pour the eggs over the items, or do you fold them in, which I believe the best omelet, to pour it over the sautéed vegetables, but that's a second, you know, non-related. But think about that. The world of omelets. How many of you even knew that there was a separate world of what makes an omelet maker? I'd have had no idea that in all these places it's someone the night before who's cracking hundreds of eggs and all these little items. I probably would have burned the first five to ten that my wife and I are trying to eat. How many of you have ever tried to flip an omelet? <laughs> How many of you have lost a lot of egg on the floor flipping an omelet? But the reality is, if you do that in a setting where you're allowed to fail, 
where you're taught what to do and where someone doesn't say, oh my goodness, we don't have any more eggs. How are we supposed to eat breakfast this morning? You learn, you grow, and you become something greater. So can you be a Christian without joining a church? Yes. Yes. Can you use spiritual gifts and not be a member of, the, of a church? Yes, we all have spiritual gifts. But a church is designed by God to have leaders who protect the people inside of the flock from maybe a false teacher, maybe someone who's got malicious intent. Church membership is that way that the leaders say, we think this person's safe. We think this person's trustworthy. We think this person can teach and lead and not cause division. And it's inside of a church that whenever you take communion, it means just a little bit more as a member. Baptism, and I'm going to put it out there too. We at Grace Bible Church believe that you have to be baptized in order to be a member of a church. Why do I say that? Is it because I love getting people wet? If you think that, then you're just kind of crazy. Um, ask my wife, ask people who really know me. I don't enjoy water. I don't enjoy lakes. I don't enjoy ponds. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's become like a phobia that I've had. I'm not like definitely afraid of that, but you know, I'm like, oh my goodness, have we sanitized this? What's going on? My, yeah, you got, I'll tell you my opinion about ponds afterwards. Um, but, whenever, but baptism, like I said last week, and I'm not arguing about how it's done. Remember, I, I think that when we argue about things instead of what we're united upon, we're, we're battling the spirit. Baptism is saying, I am no longer aligned with this kingdom, but I'm aligned with the kingdom of God. I'm no longer defining myself by anything other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only people, that, those are the people that I want in a church. It's the people who say, my identity is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, I'm, I'm going to read to you, though, something that I found. Uh, a long time ago, people made a big binder of church membership stuff at Grace Bible Church. Um, and I, I, I've selectively used parts of it. Um, most people don't read the four-page constitution we give them, so giving them a 40-page constitution, you'll guess how it goes. But it used to be that when you remember, this is what you had. It said, having received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, having been baptized, being in agreement with the Grace Bible Church statements, beliefs, practices, and willing to abide by the church's constitution, I now am led by the Holy Spirit to unite with this church family. In doing so, I commit myself to God and the members of Grace Bible Church to do the following. One, I will protect the unity of our church by acting in love towards other members, by encouraging our believers, by refusing to gossip about others, by resolving conflicts in accordance with the scriptures and the church constitution, and by supporting and cooperating with our church leaders. Wow. Who wouldn't want to be part of a group that you can say, I'm not going to be gossiped about. I'm going to be encouraged. And people are going to solve their problems with me according to the Bible. I'm going to be loved. The next, number two, is I will share in the responsibility of our church's growth by praying for its growth. Sharing the gospel, inviting the unchurched to attend, and by warmly welcoming all who attend. Who wouldn't want to be part of something that uses everybody? I mean, most of us at least have had, have had the experience or have been close to that person who was part of a team and they never got off the bench. I am the only person in my one year at Moody on that team who, whenever it had the, the number of minutes that they played, had the seconds next to it. <laughs> Everybody else had over 100 minutes. I had 18 minutes and 56 seconds. I can run a 5K faster than that. But there are many who can't even run a 5K in the amount of time that I played. But, as a member of the church, you have something you can do. Third, I will support the testimony of our church by attending faithfully, 
giving regularly and, and sacrificially, living a godly life and growing in the knowledge of God's word, the character of Christ and power of the Holy Spirit. Now that one's a little scary because it says I'm going to be stretched. I promise to be stretched. But the greater the stretching, the greater the reward. Then finally, I will serve the ministry of our church by developing a servant's heart, discovering my gifts and talents, being equipped for ministry, and touching the lives of others as God enables me. How many of you just wish that someone cared enough to help you become good at something? When you become a member of a church, that's part of the pledge. So have we as the leaders done all this? I mean, we've tried. We've had classes. We've had different things. But we can do better. Are you as a member doing everything you can to help other members as well? God designed the church to be this awesome, beautiful representation of the gospel. Where each of us come together saying, you're a sinner, but a saint. I love you. I forgive you. I join in with you to worship God together. We celebrate people's baptism saying, that's awesome. You get it. And we celebrate communion by saying, we can only do it by Jesus. I can't explain everything that goes on inside of everything that happens at a church. I'll be honest. A lot of things confuse me about how church stuff goes on and doesn't. Um, I, I served with the pastor on his 40th birthday. He said, I understand less now than I did at 23. And I get that. But part of the beauty of the church is that God's mysterious, glorious salvation has been entrusted to the church to share to the world. We are a hospital. We are a home. We are a camp for the army of God. But we aren't a camp that says we're out there to war against other people. We're out there to remind each other that our battle's not against flesh and blood. Our battle's against spiritualities and forces of this world. And we're called to help people realize you can be rescued from despair, from death. Rescued from your own self. So, I'm going to close this in prayer, and the application that we're going to immediately do is we're going to take communion together. I know that we have um, historically only done communion twice a year and had weeks leading into spiritual reflection, um, and we might be changing a little bit more soon as to how frequently we practice communion. So I'm sorry for those of you who needed a longer heads up that we have communion. But I want to remind you, based upon what we're partaking in, you are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So as I pray, I want you to reflect upon the goodness of Christ. Let's pray.